everyone. Um, good afternoon from rainy Northern California. I hope that everyone is doing well. Welcome back to day two of doodle therapy. Um, my name is Alice. I'm your host. I'm an illustrator and a muralist. And today, please welcome our very special guest back for day two, um, Shirley Wu. Welcome, Shirley. Hello. Thank you so much. Yeah. It was good to be back. Great Very to be back. For day two. Great to be back yeah. and to continue with our data projects. <laughs> um, if you're joining us live, yes. please uh, feel free to introduce yourself in the chat, share where you're joining us from. And ooh, I didn't think about a question of the day. So um, maybe, maybe the question of the day will be, uh, if you'd like to, please share something that you're excited about working on, whether it's a personal project, mm. professional, um, could be art related or not, we'd love to hear. Um, so yeah, if you're new to Doodle Therapy, this is a bi-weekly show here on Adobe Live. Um, it is our hour to chill and doodle and relax while still chatting with a special guest every week and uh, deep diving into a new area of illustration to learn about. And since this is an interactive show, you know, every week we have a different interactive prompt that you can also join along and uh, learn along with us. Um, so yeah, it's great to see you all. Um, hey to Sydney, Newberry in the chat, as well as, um, <laughs> yeah, as well as Sam and Chris. It's uh, great to see everyone. Um, so let's jump into it. Um, Shirley uh, will be chatting with us today about creating data art, data visualizations, as Shirley is a data artist herself. And we've got some of Shirley's lovely work here up on the, on the screen. Shirley, could you tell us a little bit about yourself um, and reintroduce yourself? Yeah, definitely. So hi, my name is Shirley. And uh, the official title that I've given myself is independent creator of data visualizations. And so basically what that means is that I work with a variety of different companies, um, clients across uh, mostly the tech and media and journalism industries. And I try to help them make sense of their data and tell visual stories with the data. And I work with them through analyzing the data, uh, design designing and prototyping, and then finally coding for the web. Um, and so some of the work that uh, Alice has up for us is my much more kind of creative data art side. Um, but I kind of dabble between more, slightly more traditional. So you might have like seen, you know, data visualizations could be like line charts and bar charts, um, all the way to the kind of like more um, creative expression side, which is the side that I really enjoy and um, the side that we've kind of been working on in the last two days. Yeah, and I think it's so um, interesting to look at examples of your work because, uh, you know, I feel like most people who watch this stream are probably designers, creatives, illustrators who don't spend as much time in the data space as obviously you do. Um, and so what comes to mind for most people when they think of data is probably charts, bar graphs, the things that you might see in like the newspaper or like a article. Um, but I think it's really cool to see examples of this like up on your side of the screen, we can see some of the art that you've created. And it's cool to realize that every leaf, for example, on that tree represents something meaningful. It's not just a leaf that you put there to like look cool. It, it has a meaning. Um, yeah, and that's something that I would love to jump into, you know, at the beginning of our stream, um, just for people who aren't as familiar as what we mean when we say uh, data art. Um, and I just want to show some of your projects. Um, do you mind describing, you know, really quickly what data viz and data art is to you? 
Oh, yeah, definitely. So uh, I think of data visualization and data art as something like a little bit different from each other. So whereas data visualization is kind of about wanting to communicate something that we found in the data. Um, and so in data visualization, we're a little bit more strict about, you know, uh, if we decide to map, let's say something in the data, let's say an example as simple as, you know, temperatures across a year. And let's say we've like decided to map the temperature to the Y position and the uh, day of the year to the exposition in data visualization, um, like those mappings are really important, and we try to be as accurate as we can be, and so that whatever visualization we're putting out there does not mislead or misinform anybody that's like our end audience. Um, and so that's data visualization. Um, and on the flip side, kind of like on the other side of the spectrum, I think of like data art, which is we use, um, and it's quite similar to generative art, which is like, you know, using kind of random number generators to create something like beautiful um, and sometimes abstract. So data art is kind of similar, except Using, instead of using like random number generators, we use uh, data. And so for example, what uh, Alice has pulled up is um, one of my projects called Film Flowers, where I basically used uh, movies data to generate these flowers. So each of the flowers are a movie and each of the petal shapes are mapped to parental guidance ratings, the colors to the genre of the movie and the size of the flower to their IMDb ratings out of 10. Um, mm. I still try to be as accurate and precise as I can. So it's not like misleading, but like, you know, people won't get mad if like, <laughs> if there's something a little bit like imprecise about how I've mapped you know, these movie data to flowers. Like that, I think that's why I enjoy data art a little bit more because uh, people don't get as mad. <laughs> people aren't like, oh my God, your, your like graph is misleading. Yeah. Um, I also do want to say uh, hi to everyone joining us in the chat, to Amy, to Yuvin, to Keith, who actually was part of our first student therapy stream. So remember that you have, you had that cat that visits you in your backyard. Um, to Ooh. Richard, it's great to see you all. Um, uh, uh, so yeah, um, basically, you know, when you look at this wonderful film flowers project that Shirley made, you might think like, this is a nice collection of flowers, looks good, but actually what, you know, every single flower, every single detail, like the petal size, petal shape has a meaning behind it. So that's cool to see like this movie, Scooby-Doo, uh, you know, didn't get <laughs> as good ratings as, um, yeah. Pirates of the Caribbean, <laughs> Curse of the Black Pearl. So this one has a smaller flower. Um, Ooh, and, that, and then, oh, sorry. I was going to say the Twilight series is also really tiny. Oh, really? That's <laughs> funny. Yeah. Twilight. It's fun, like, finding your favorite movies in there. Oh, yeah. The Twilight, this Twilight <laughs> movie is, like, so tiny compared to Inception. So wasn't mm -hmm. as well received, apparently. Um, so that, you know, segues really nicely into our prompt for this week, uh, which is probably one of the most technically educational prompts that we've had so far on Doodle Therapy. Um, which is to create a data visualization or a piece of data art, uh, whichever you prefer. Um, you can use a piece of data from your everyday life or whatever you want to do. For example, the meals that you ate or the music that you listened to. We all have so much rich data in our lives. Or um, if you'd like, Shirley has created a wonderful data set uh, of the... Um, past female winners of the Nobel Prize, of which yeah. there are only 50, uh, right, mm -hmm. apparently, um, compared to hundreds of men, uh, male winners, uh, which it, which seems a little suspect to me. But So um, <laughs> this, this is based on Shirley's um, original project called Legends, which this is a great example of using this data set. So every crystal here that you see represents a female Nobel laureate um, and every yellow star here represents a male male winner so you can see that mm -hmm. you know every the size the shape the color all represents uh, something different um, yeah surely uh, I know I sort of explained it but actually you're the expert here so do you have any um, additional thoughts about this or should we ju just dive right in yeah, let's dive in, right in. You gave a really great explanation of everything. Um, yeah. So I think we were talking about, so uh, I I went um, and kind of finished my teacups 
a little bit more last night. Um, and then oh, for my cool. teacups, I uh, kind of tried to draw out um, a teacup for each different continent. Um, and then I took it into Photoshop and then I, I arranged it and I realized I really don't like how it looks. <laughs> and I was wondering, Alice, do you, do you get this um, thing where whatever was in your mind, it like just does not come out as good <laughs> when oh. it's translated onto, it happens to me all the time with data um, where I have this idea um, where I'm like, this is going to look great. And then the data is like, nope, uh, you've decided to map me this way. Um, and it's not going to look good. <laughs> and that's yeah. essentially what happened. <laughs> um, well, actually, um, to start off, um, I do want to say I've noticed that uh, Jessica in the chat says that the Twilight series was popular when they were in middle school. So actually, I think a fun question of the day, part two, would be what was your favorite like major movie uh, back in your childhood? Um, shout it out in the chat and then we will look it up in Shirley's project. So you can see like Twilight, for example, Ooh. uh, had a lot of Ooh. genres, but it wasn't received as well. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, the only caveat to that particular project, it's, it's the top five top summer blockbusters per year. So oh, we'll okay. be able to find it if it was a summer blockbuster. <laughs> Got it. Yeah. So maybe think about like the big hits that you really like. I of really like Inception. Yes. Of the summer. Um, Ooh. and my, my part two is, um, do you actually mind explaining a little bit about like, uh, you know, for people who are just joining in today, what exactly you're mapping, you're creating these teacups for, like, what is the mapping that you've created? Um, maybe starting from the, uh, data set that you've set up for us. Ooh, yeah. Great question. Thank you for asking. So, yeah. um, uh, one of the core parts of data visualization is deciding, uh, uh, first looking at what we have in the data, like what attributes we have in the data, um, and then deciding how we want to show that visually. So um, for this particular data set, we have a few different things like uh, the year that the uh, woman received her award, uh, the continent, uh, the category of her awards. So that could be like peace or literature or uh, medicine, et cetera. Um, and then deciding on, um, so if you think of, uh, we call uh, we call it uh, visual channels. And so if you kind of think about when you're designing something and designing something, you probably already naturally do this where like, you're like, oh, uh, I want to place this thing uh, in this position on my canvas. And that position has like values, right? Underneath the hood, there's like X and Y values. Sometimes you might be like drawing a circle and you'll be like, oh, I want it to be this size. And that that's a value too, it, that's radius. And maybe you draw a square and that's width and height. And so basically uh, with visualizations, we, we just map um, whatever is in our data to uh, each of these values, each of these like XY positions or width and height or radius or even things like angle. Um, and then, mm. uh, and then because of that, we can kind of see insights. So for example, um, in uh, this particular project, I decided to map um, a data attribute I call uh, influence to radius. And so that means that uh, anybody with really big influence would be, would have a really large, uh, would, would look really large. And anybody with smaller influence would be smaller, literally on the canvas. Um, and so for myself, I uh, decided to map uh, the x-axis as the year that they received the award. Um, hmm. And then um, I believe I just uh, mapped the y-axis to the age at which they received the award. Um, and so you can already start seeing kind of interesting things. So uh, if you see my canvas, um, so I'm gonna just draw a yellow uh, dot here. So that's the early 1900s. And then it's interesting because these pink and orange teacups are uh, represent Europe and America's uh, respectively. And then uh, you can see that up until about the 17, or, sorry, 1970s here, all of the winners were from Europe or America. And then I started kind of like, um, I have this teacup that I tried to make like more Asian <laughs> looking. <laughs> and so this is uh, someone from Asia. I think this is Mother Teresa. Um, and then Malala is here. Um, and mm. uh, so kind of, uh, you know, in the 
early half of the century, it was all Europe and Americas, and then only starting from the 70s did other continents start getting represented. So that's what I find extremely fascinating about data visualization of kind of being able to even just with some like, you know, you know, I only mapped two things. And just just from that initial mapping, we're like, oh, look at this. And then also look, this is Malala. She's all the way down at the bottom because she's the youngest ah. winner of the Nobel Prize. Um, and here are the ones that like, you know, uh, a lot of them when um, when they're probably in their 40s and 50s, and this is like probably when they're like in their 80s. And so just two value mappings and like we already see insights. And I think that's so fun um, Yeah. when it comes to data viz, yeah. So to recap, the if you could go back to your fresco, um, yeah, which you're using as well as Photoshop, um, the color of the teacup represent oh, yeah. the color of the teacup corresponds to the uh, continent that the uh, winner of the Nobel laureate uh, is from, and mm -hmm. the x-axis horizontal refers to time, so like you know, yeah. 1900s to now. And then the y-axis, the vertical, represents the winner's age. So yeah. um, it's cool to see that as time goes on, like as you move along the horizontal axis, uh, you get more of a spread, both in terms of the age, because the graph kind of goes like this, and then yeah, also in terms right. of the diversity of winners, because the graph changes from pink and orange, which is Europe and North America, to include Asia uh, and other uh, continents as well. Yeah, yeah, and then you can actually see there's only one person from Australia. This one blue, blue one is Australia, oh. and the the green ones are Africa. Um, oh. And another fun thing about data arts or data viz is um, we like to think about visual metaphors. So whatever we decide, however we decide to visualize, to try and like tie it back somehow to the original data set. So like, um, I don't think I was that great at this <laughs> in drawing these tea sets, but like I tried to make the Asian continents look more like the teacup look hopefully a little bit more Asian. Ah, um, yeah, I tried I to make Europe and Americas look kind of similar to each other. Um, Australia, for some reason, I was like, they have a lot of water. <laughs> yeah, they're surrounded by water on all sides. Also, it's funny, yeah, Eric, so Eric says back to math class, guys. <laughs> it's just funny. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, and that's something that we were talking about yesterday too, right? Like that um, there is a lot of math and stats in data viz, uh, but only if you choose to go down that path. Um, because uh, like, I think even this mapping, this like mapping between data and, you know, all of these visual channels, there's actually a lot of tools online that will help you make this mapping. Um, and so you don't actually have to do the math yourself um, and you can just like pull in your data set and then be like, OK, I uh, I'm going to, you know, they'll have like drop downs for you, kind of how like I made it. And then you can and then um, and then you don't have to do any math on your own part. You can just go in and kind of do all of the kind of design parts um, yeah. and illustration parts. Um, ooh, I see uh, Ubin. You been? You been? Yes, you been. Hello. Um, so yeah, mm -hmm. if if uh, you're curious exactly about um, what we're referring to, um, Shirley has basically created this excellent tool where you can interpret her personal data set um, of the women Nobel laureates, and you can filter by a lot of things. For example, here I'm filtering by year, so that gives me um, more winners or less winners. Um, and then you can also map the data to the y-axis to mean different things, x-axis, the radius, the size. So this is this is like stats class, back to AP stats, um, but like art edition with Shirley. <laughs> um, I also want to say uh, um, uh, thanks everyone for sending in their favorite uh, films. Let's check it out. So Keith says yeah. Terminator. All right, so Terminator, it looks like here, um, they, Terminator 3, that is, they, um, they were, it was a moderate success in terms of um, reviews. Maybe it was different in terms of money earned. Um, and it was two categories, pink and yellow. So that's action and other. Um, oh, Terminator oh, 3. Yes. Terminator oh, yeah, 3. I think that had a, yeah. 
Terminator 3 did much better than Terminator mm. Genesis as well as Terminator, sorry, Terminator 2 did much better than Terminator 3. Um, <laughs> and uh, let's see, Jurassic Park. Jurassic, Ooh. Jurassic Park, okay, Jurassic Park, the original, did pretty good that year, you know, compared to the rest of the films in their uh, blockbuster hits in that summer. They're, mm -hmm. um, they're the biggest flower. What does the number of petals mean? Oh, yeah. So number of petals is uh, the number of uh, votes, IMDb votes. So oh, basically, okay. the more petals, it means that the more people voted like their rating out of 10. Oh, so like, got it. essentially, that's another popularity, right? Like some yeah. of them could have a lot of petals because a lot of people watched it, but really small because everybody watched it and was like, wow, this is crap. Oh, OK, <laughs> so it's it's like the passionate, how passionately people felt about it, whether it's good or bad. Yeah. <laughs> Um, Amy said Shrek was a big hit, but I don't see Shrek Ooh. actually. So, which which is surprising to you? Is it not? I felt like yeah, Shrek I was it such was a summer too. such a big hit. Um, uh, ooh, Pocahontas is here. Um, ooh. Hunger Games and um, oh, Harry oh, Hunger Potter Games also is, is not on. Harry Potter. Ooh, okay, we've got a bunch of Harry Potters on here. So, Harry Potter five. Um, what do the petals mean? Oh, so that's my little Easter egg of I did this project because I haven't seen many movies at all. So mm -hmm. the uh, leaves mean uh, one leaf means that I've seen it um, and two leaves mean that I've seen it in theaters. Um, oh, okay. And this project was to was for me to see whether I truly have not seen that many like popular movies. And I haven't. I've only seen like 25 out of the 120 on this list. <laughs> Got it. Um, Princess Bride. Oh, Princess Bride is also not on here. Um, so that doesn't yeah, mean so that I they, think... yeah, this, it, it just means that mean they weren't oh, the top five of the summer. Yeah. Like, it yeah. just means they weren't the top five of the summer. That's it. Yeah. Um, Maybe that ooh, summer I... there was, there was a lot of, um, hits. So Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I, I really like Yubin's question about, um, why, uh, teacups. And for me, I really like, um, I really like the idea of uh, these women like chilling in a Parisian salon together, doing the enlightenment, like sipping on their tea and exchanging knowledge. And that's that's the only reason why for me it's teacups. <laughs> Ooh, love it. So um, yeah, kind of what we were saying yesterday is uh, one, I think like really fun and easy way to brainstorm, like what to draw for your data viz is, um, I like to just think about what I want to draw in general so it could be completely unrelated to, um, you know, mm -hmm. the project. It could be, I want to draw puppies or I want to draw like bowls of noodles, you know, or I, I want to draw like <laughs> spaceships and um, figure out a way to apply that to your prompt. So maybe if you're drawing um, these, you know, using this data set of past women, women Nobel no laureates, you could draw like spaceships that represent the different winners. Um, and I actually think that's a good approach to take in general for illustration. Um, I do like to think about just like, what do I just naturally want to draw? And sometimes when the client approaches me with a prompt and then I'll, and then I'll just apply that to, um, you know, to the prompt question. So for mine, um, I'm drawing planets. So the way that I set this up is um, first, I uh, just copied and pasted the graph that Shirley's handy dandy tool generated and you can save it as well. Um, and then I just overlaid it to um, create these planet shapes. And yesterday I worked on setting out the shapes. And then today I'm going to work on, you know, making these look more planet-like. And to that end, I have put together a mood board, um, a lot of Makaro Shinkai inspired landscapes. Um, it's just landscapes planets. are so beautiful. Yeah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> planets are so cool. And I also wanted to share, um, if you've been watching the stream regularly, uh, our stream uh, two guests ago was with Lauren Hom, the letterer. And uh, the phrase that I lettered that um, that stream was making art breaking hearts. And I've still been noodling on it. Um, on the stream, I mentioned that I might either turn this into like a jacket or a neon sign or a rug. <laughs> and maybe all, um, who knows? And so, all of the um, above. <laughs> yeah. And so this is kind of where, what I'm working on. And it, um, I think it just goes to show like, 
even though we only stream for like two days and one hour on each day, like I think a lot of these projects are nice jumping off points for longer term sorts of projects. And, and I've actually taken a couple of um, my past doodle therapy projects to final. So uh, it's like always fun. Um, and um, oh, also hey to Maddie for uh, joining us. And Jessica wants to know if Shirley imported a spreadsheet into Excel in order to create the data viz into Photoshop. So maybe um, did you create did you import a spreadsheet into Excel and then into your tool, which you, um, yeah. which is linked in the description. And then that's how you got the visual. Yeah. So as of right now, um, there isn't quite a way to map data directly in Photoshop. And that's why um, that tool that Alice has been showing, um, indeed it, uh, it links to a Google spreadsheets. Um, but I actually wanted to make a shout out because um, there is apparently um, a project with, internally at Adobe called Project Lincoln, um, oh, cool. which I think, uh, premiered, or not premiered, I think um, they showed it off at, I think, the 2017 Adobe Max. Um, it's a really cool um, uh, concept of uh, basically doing exactly what I described of mapping, you know, like pulling in data and then choosing, you know, like columns to map to different like width or height of a bar, et cetera. Um, but then inside kind of like a um, UI that you're already familiar with, that's kind of like, you know, Adobe Photoshop like. Um, mm. And so you can, you can basically do the visualiz the data mappings uh, without any code. Um, and that's some an idea that uh, was shown at uh, Adobe Max and it was called Project Lincoln. And I think if you look it up on YouTube, um, it's up on YouTube and it's a super cool demonstration um, and they're still working on it. Um, and I really hope that like they productize it soon because it was a really mm. cool demo. Yeah, that is exciting. I didn't know that. Um, go Adobe for making the tools uh like so integrated um yeah. oh kennedy uh kj adams wants to know what is something you wish you knew sooner when starting on photoshop and fresco what a great question thanks for asking mm -hmm. kennedy um i go first um i i think that so like photoshop is actually an amazing tool um i'm not just saying that because this is like the adobe <laughs> stream like adobe uh sorry photoshop and or like my internet browser chrome are probably the two most uh, two apps that I use the most, and there's I feel like I'm constantly learning new features about Photoshop. Like, you know, I, I'll just like go mm -hmm. in and look at the menu, and then there's always like something new that I learned. Um, the tool that I really like using a lot um, in my work it's the um, I don't know the Lock Transparent Pixels tool. So. Um, I've demoed it a couple times. So let's say I have a circle shape here. Uh, you know, I can I can add to this or I can draw on top of it. But let's say I want to like color in the circle. So what I'll do is I'll go to my layers panel and then I'll go to the uh, lock uh, row and then I'll hit this transparency like checkered board option. Um, and then that allows me to draw within that shape, but it locks the like drawable canvas space to just be where you've already drawn pixels. So that allows me to do things like, let's say I want to add a cool gradient onto this uh, really quickly. Um, I can just uh, select my gradient tool and then draw a gradient onto it. And it locks it to that um, to that shape. If I didn't have that locked, then the gradient would be drawn below it. But um, you know, that lock transparency is really helpful. And you can do it, you can do this in a lot of ways. For example, you can use a clipping mask and then, you know, draw on top of it. But um, sometimes you just want to like move really quickly and uh, having that lock transparency feature uh, is, is really helpful for that. So I hope that helps. That's kind of like one of my, my favorite um, features. Um, Ooh, actually, I was going to say that uh, watching your stream like taught me that one, um, especially because I'm really, really new to digital like Kind of like digital painting and like pretty new to um a lot of these like fresco 
Um, and so the law, I actually never knew about log transparency. And when you showed that in a previous stream, I was like, this changes my world. Yeah. It's like you learn, like you, for me, it's always like a pattern of doing things the hard way. And then like yeah. finding out one day on like a forum or tutorial that like, oh my God, <laughs> like Adobe has this feature. I can just lock the transparency. And then it's like, wow, I could have been doing this the whole time. Um, actually also just to flip it back <laughs> to the uh, viewers, if what is your favorite like feature in either Fresco or Photoshop that you wish you had known Ooh. when you first started learning? I mean, there there's so many features for real. Like um, I hosted my friend Meg Hunt on Adobe Live a few years ago, like back when we were actually in the studio pre-COVID. And um, she was showing me, uh, I think it's like layer presets or like layer actions where she just has a row of buttons at the bottom of her Photoshop and she'll press Ooh. the button and it applies all these actions to the layer that is selected. Like, um, oh, you yeah, know, it'll, I've seen those. Yeah, it's like magical. Uh, it's like having a, um, having a dashboard or something like you're on a rocket ship and you're just like, you know, <laughs> engage or uh, what's that thing in, in Star Wars? Um, a force, oh, I no, am the wrong person. light speed. It's like light speed effect, you know. Um, let's see. Oh, um, Amy says um, that I taught her how to rotate canvas. Yeah, that's another one I like. Um, so I, I, when I draw, you know, I, I, I like to, you know, flick my wrist a lot and I like to move my hand. So it, it isn't very helpful for me to have the canvas be um, mm. so static because otherwise I end up moving my body because I like to draw at an angle sometimes. So one really easy thing you can do is um, press R or go to your um, this uh, handy dandy sidebar here and press uh, this button. Or it might be selected as the hand tool, so you'll select the one as rotate under it, and then um, then you can rotate your canvas and then um, you know draw on top of it. It's very helpful. And the way you get out of that is you can hit escape. Uh, ooh, we're getting so many great. Uh, Suggestions. Yubin says gradient map Ooh. adjustment layers in Photoshop. That's cool. Um, uh, Keith says I'm thinking lock transparency. Yep, that is what I was describing. Um, oh, hyperdrive. Uh, Brittany says they love the symmetry tool. Yeah, I didn't. Okay, so I didn't even know there was a symmetry tool. Are you talking about Fresco? Um, oh. If there is a symmetry tool in Photoshop, I'm going to like uh, have a stern talking to to my past self because that would have saved me a lot. <laughs> Um, yeah, Kennedy says when they learned about the knife tool, they were like, what? There's a knife tool? I didn't even know. Oh. Where's the knife tool? Knife tool. One, one, one thing I like to do to quickly find things is, is I actually go to help and then I search for the, uh, the feature and, and, um, it gets you there really quickly. Like sometimes I'll go to help and I'll search blur because I'm too lazy to go to filter and then blur. So I'll just do blur <laughs> and it gets me there. And then you can select the blur that you want. So, um, uh, surely I interrupted you, um, but what is the, um, what is a feature that you wish that you had known? Oh, no, I was going to say that, um, I totally agree with like the layer, oh, the layer transparency. And also I wish I wasn't so intimidated by like just layer masks. Um, I think a lot of the tools that I think, uh, aren't at once apparent. I think I was intimidated by a lot of those and those are so helpful. I also uh, am quite passionate on this topic because um, my background is in uh, like my my kind of career background is in software engineering. And for the mm -hmm. longest time, I had this like weird, it's not weird, actually, it's quite common. Like it's this like kind of toxic pride thing. That's like, if you're a coder, you're like, oh, I'm going to do everything in code because then that's hardcore and I'm hardcore which I'm not. Um, and then, so for the longest time, I used code as my tool for absolutely everything, even when it didn't make sense to use code as my tool. Um, and so, oh. uh, and so I would like do something like two X slower than someone else, because I was insistent on just coding it. And, um, I have learned the error of my ways and I am on this mission to like find, um, tools that make the most sense for each of my kind of like, um, task flows. And so another thing is um, the reason why I'm so excited about this is because, uh, for example, the film flowers that you saw, 
um, I uh, hand coded the SVG. Like in a text editor, I wrote out the SVG path commands. Um, and so I've been exploring like Illustrator, so I don't have to do that fresco, so that I don't have to like hand write SVG paths and like just like draw it out instead. And mm. also these kind of like um, doing fresco so that I can like do more kind of like doodle like things and just kind of like expand what my like expand my repertoire so that it like trying to explore different styles so yeah not exactly answering sorry not exactly answering the question about photoshop but just kind of in general about tools yeah um ooh, uh, our chat is saying <laughs> garrick says holy cow amount of stuff um thanks to sam for pointing out that the uh symmetry tool is in the brush if you go to if you press b and go to brush and there's a butterfly tool then you can, oh my gosh, you have a vertical line and then you can, oh my gosh, Whoa. that's so cool. Dude, you could save so much time with this. I didn't <laughs> even know that. You draw a heart. That's amazing. And then you just, I guess, I'm assuming you just turn it off by pressing. Wow, that's so cool. Thank you so much. The way that I used to do it, because I, I feel like there's always like multiple ways to achieve an effect that you want in Photoshop. There's just like the feature the Adobe usually has like a feature itself that is like the most direct way. But even if you don't know of that feature, there are like a million ways to do it. So before, if I wanted to draw like a heart, I would draw half of a heart and then I would duplicate it. So oh. I duplicated it and then I would flip it horizontally and then I would select both layers and then I would merge them down and then, then I would have the heart. But now you can just uh, draw it once vertical. Oops. Oh, you can even adjust the symmetry. And then, and then I got my heart. Cool. Thank you guys for Ooh. teaching me something. Um, Caitlin says that they've also gone through the code is the only way to prove how hard I am. <laughs> face. <laughs> yes, I'm glad I'm not the only one. And it's so weird and toxic because people will be like, oh, you use a, like a GUI for Git, which is like, um, for like code versioning and they're like, oh, you don't use the command line. You're not. Oh, awesome. like you use the, you use like a nice like interface. Yeah. That's yeah. funny. And it's like one button, um, but I'm like, it's one button as opposed to writing out a whole line. I don't know. Okay. So this is, this is something I have a lot of feelings about and we don't need to get into it. <laughs> no, it's fine. I feel like every um, creative discipline has their version of like, I need to do like this, I need to like do these things that actually make my life harder, but it's like the pure way to do it. Um, like for example, yeah. um, I think like in mural painting, there is, I'm not knocking it by the way. I think it's like very respectable and probably teaches you good skills. Um, but uh, there is like, I think this uh, culture sometimes amongst certain muralists that like you should freehand everything. And you sh if you use like a projector oh. or if you use like a grid, then it's like, not as like you're not legit like, yeah it's like you know a real artist you know doesn't need that um which i can see how you know if you did not use a grid or project onto the wall like it would probably help you develop faster skills mm -hmm. you know because mm -hmm. you have to you're forced you're forcing yourself to like be really good at That's true. transposing your artwork but at the same time it also probably makes your life like slightly harder in the moment because oftentimes when you're painting a mural you're like on a lift or you're in like an uncomfortable mm. position because you're like on mm -hmm. top you're perched on top of like a roof or something so like you know you kind of want things to be as like e straightforward as possible in that moment so i can see like both sides um and yeah like maybe to to the um to the get people's point like maybe <laughs> doing things command line gives you a better sense of like how things work on the like command that's line. True. Um, that's true um but at the same yeah. time like you also just don't want to deal with that like all the time so yeah yeah that's a really fair point what do you think is like the best what what would you say like would be the best of both worlds do you think like um 
Like, would you practice on your own time or like, for example, for me, I think I'm a firm believer of understanding how something works. Um, And so I'll go and do it the hard way just so I can understand how it works, but only for things that I really care about. So that's why like to this day, Git confuses me like so much, but I don't think I care that much because I, it just doesn't matter as much to me, but like, I'm curious about you, Alice of like, um, what would be the kind of like best of both worlds for you in your case for like, for example, your mural example? Yeah. Um, that's a great question. I think, I think you're absolutely right. Um, and it goes to like the question of freelancing as well and experimenting, um, where when I'm working with a client, I, I don't want to like be totally improvising and have, Mm. I want to minimize my like room for error, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Um, I still will like experiment and stuff, but I don't want to like do it on their dime, if that makes sense. Mm, That Um, makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. If I'm going to experiment with a new technique, I would feel more comfortable if I did it on my own time first. Um, which isn't to say that I don't try new things when I work with clients. It's just that, um, think like freehanding a mural if, if you're not like comfortable with it doesn't seem like a setting yourself up for success if you're like success, yeah. doing it for the first time that totally with a client. makes sense so it's good to like yeah practice. that's I uh, I think I agree with that in that um I think of it as a client is coming to me because they're paying for my expertise and and I, I charge them a decent amount so they should I should I should be like you know, using my expertise. But then at the same time, there are so many like new, cool, shiny things that I want to try. And so I try those on the side. I guess the only thing that's kind of a little bit of a downside about trying it on the side um, in my own time, which I enjoy, I love doing my own personal projects, but the only downside is that then like those are not paid work. And so there's like a, there's kind of this guilty, I, I feel like I used to have this like guilty feeling of, um, oh, this is the time I could be making money, but I'm choosing mm. not to. And I feel like we've discussed this in the past too, of like this balance of like, um, especially living in Silicon Valley of this like feeling that I need to make more and more and more. Um, but then realizing that like, that's actually not what's that important. And I actually like learned this kind of, instead of thinking about, the maximum of what I can earn as a freelancer to concentrate on the minimum of what I need to have a comfortable living. And I learned that from our conversations, Alice. Oh, this is a really yeah. interesting topic. I want to, um, I want to really quickly jump back to the chat. Um, cause there, Ooh, yeah. there's also a lovely, um, back and forth going on about like, we live in the modern era. So using, taking advantage of modern tools. I totally agree. <laughs> um, uh, Let's see, Jessica had a question about how you created your data viz. Um, So we'll get to that in a second. Um, You know, did she hand draw each data point or did she use something called Tableau? Um, I, so back to the the question, so I just want to say that to let you guys know that we, Mm -hmm. um, we saw your chat and uh, we're not, I'm not ignoring. Um, And I also want to say right now in my um, data viz process, I am, Transfer. I'm tra- I'm starting to label each planet so that you know what it looks like. Um, so Ooh. I've come up with a couple of lockups. I'm using um, this font is called Palm Canyon Drive. It's by my friends, the Hoodspot twins um, at Hoodspot Design. They have awesome um, fonts that they've created. Uh, I really like this because it feels like handwritten, um, and I paired it with Proxima Nova, which is more of a neutral kind of font um, when paired with this kind of script. So I am playing with a couple of different lockups. Uh, if you have a preference, let me know if you like the horizontal versus the vertical. I like the vertical, but the problem is um, if there is a uh, name that has a lot of um, like Y's or G's where like the mm-hmm. descender goes below the mm-hmm. baseline. I don't know if these are the right words. Um, having it below, yeah. um, means that the, the label either cuts in or it has to be like much lower than the name, which doesn't look as like tight compositionally. So let me know if you have a preference or any ideas of how to, uh, solve for that. So, um, yeah, back to the, uh, point that you raised Shirley about, um, I think like over optimizing 
in the mm-hmm. uh, hustle culture of Silicon Valley. Um, <laughs> yeah, I totally agree. I think there's like there's thing there's good things you can try to take from it. Um, like I definitely feel like I've probably had a much more productive twenties that I would have if I you know were living at home or something. Like just being an SF has helped me just go for my dreams a lot uh, Mm -hmm. more proactively. But I do think there's like a dark side to it where, you know, it's not, that's not all there is to life. And um, you kind of, you kind of have to just like realize that what the system wants for you is not aligned with what you want for yourself. And it takes a little bit of time to like, understand and start to accept that like I feel like I'm starting to wake up for that and be like oh I don't really need to like prove myself as long as I'm taking care of myself um so what does my like ideal career look like in that case mm-hmm. uh, I'm not sure if I like, like that a lot yeah um yeah so that's kind of where I've landed how about yourself I think I'm still working through it of like, um, I'm trying to, I'm trying to feel better about doing things that I enjoy instead of purely for the money. Um, but I do feel the pressure of like, uh, we, we, we bought a place like two years ago. So I do feel the pressure of like a mortgage and the pressure of like, I, uh, like good food. (laughs) Really yeah, like this is the sushi. real talk that um, <laughs> that that we we've, we've been promising. Yeah, uh, Alice uh, jokingly calls me a uh, team. Oh, there's uh, a little bit of a backstory. Uh, we we uh, um, are in the same uh, studio office in uh, SF, and um, <laughs> uh, Alice calls uh, me Team Bonene, which is this delicious Japanese place uh, next or very near our studio, um, which is a very good descriptor of the kind of food I like. So I feel all of these like financial, um, like not obligations, but like kind of like pressures. Um, and I'm just trying to do my best figuring out like, how can I still maintain a uh, standard of living that I'm happy with, um, yeah. but don't necessarily stress me out trying to take uh, client projects that don't make me happy? Um, I haven't, I, I still, I feel like I'm still on that journey and I haven't quite figured it out yet. Um, but um, I think even realizing that that was kind of the trap, the kind of like negative cycle vortex that I was getting myself into. Um, I think even that realization is really helpful. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I, I love this topic. I, I wish that people <laughs> would talk more about um, finances. You don't have to get into like specific details because I, I recognize it is like a kind of vulnerable and for some people, yeah, definitely. awkward thing to share. But I think it is helpful to talk about like your perspective or your goals, you know. Um, and I think that it like benefits everyone because um, financial health and literacy should be taught in schools, but it's like not. So the way that we yeah. can sort of overcome that is by like sharing with each other and like learning amongst our, our ourselves. Um, Oh, I want to say hi to Rin likes to draw. Hello. And Brittany says um, they love this conversation. It's something they've been thinking about lately. Um, yeah, so. Mm-hmm. Sorry, um, I uh, I remember Brittany um, and. Oh, wait, I think Brittany had a comment about Webflow, which is um, Tableau. Oh, uh, website, website building. Um, I remember you did a mural for them, but I recently tried them out and I was like, I agree with Brittany. Like, I was like, why do I even code? um all of these things like hand code all of these things when webflow makes it so much easier yeah. and it's something about like i think um i but i i think that um there are sentiments um from coders that are like oh no they're gonna take away our jobs and i don't think so like i'm i'm now fully embracing all of these tech that's like um it replaces all of the busy work that we hated doing anyways and then frees us up for our like doing 
like I love coding, but also I hate having to do repetitive code. And so I think it really frees me up to do the kind of uh, code that I really enjoy. Um, I, I wanted to comment on that. And then I also wanted to uh, come back to Jessica's uh, question about how I create my database. So I, um, I, uh, the project Lincoln um, is not productized yet. So that's just a, I don't know if there's like, I don't, I don't actually know if like Adobe uh, if there's like a voting feature that Adobe has for like you <laughs> like show that there's demand for this. Um, but it's it's not a product yet. It, it was a proof of concept that they showed in um, the 2017 Adobe Max. I highly recommend just like uh, finding that clip on YouTube. Um, so, but uh, for me, I create my data visualizations um, for the web and JavaScript. So um, I use this JavaScript library called D3. That's um, the most popular one for creating data visualizations on the web. Um, and I use a few other JavaScript libraries. So like my workflow um, contains both kind of like just sketching out, uh, like it goes from um, analyzing data um, with like kind of like kind of quick charting tools. Then I sketch out ideas on my iPad and then I take it into code. Um, and so, yeah, I've also never used Tableau, which I think was, yeah, also mm -hmm. that part of the question. Um, and Tableau is also kind of like this, I think the biggest software for um, creating uh, data visualizations, or I think it's most commonly used for like dashboards. So I just wanted to answer that really quickly. Thank you. Oh, um, Chris Olson has a question. Um, in data art, you only want to show, if you only want to show an X axis, can you have that axis be wavy instead of straight? That's kind of what I'm doing actually Ooh, right now. Yeah, yeah, that's a really great question. So um, I think Alice and I were actually talking about this of, um, I, when she first showed me that sketch, I was like, oh, just be a little bit careful in how you annotate your axes because um, I think, for example, if you have something that's like going up, people naturally will think that there is some sort of a connotation to the fact that they're all rising up, that there's like a positive trend or like a correlation there. So usually if you're doing data visualization, um, that's kind of like a no-no because it's creating trends and patterns um, where there isn't any. So that's something to be really careful about. But because this is data art, um, I think as long as we have really clear labeling um, to be like, this is how I mapped my uh, axes, or you can just say, this is data art and here's the data mappings um, and there's no meaning to like, you know, the X axis or something, then I think that's okay too. Um, but yeah, there's there's a lot of considerations that go into data visualization um, that we obviously don't have time to cover on here. But um, if you're interested, there is like a lot of books out there um, that cover this topic in like great detail. Yeah, um, thanks for explaining. And I also just finished labeling all my planets. So I think my next step is to um, do the details on the planets. Um, <gasps> yes. Yeah, to some of the folks in the chat who are commenting about Webflow, um, I think Webflow is really, it definitely has a steep learning curve if you are not familiar with front end coding or just like the, you don't have to know how to front end code, but like just the principles in it, like what is like padding, mm -hmm. you know, what is a margin? How, how do things sit on a page? Like how are things positioned? Stuff like that. Um, if you just, I think if you took, took a little bit of time to, familiarize yourself. And also Webflow has a lot of really um, useful tutorials. Like I painted a mural in their mm -hmm. office a couple of years ago. So I got to like befriend um, a couple of the folks who are like in charge of the office move. And it's actually really cute because the um, the founders, uh, it's like a family kind of business. So like the founder's dad yeah. helped them do all the like electrical and lighting and stuff. And they all like hung oh. out and stuff. It was really cute. Um, but they, they put a lot of, they have a room that's like their studio room and it's for filming tutorials. So um, you should definitely check out, it's like, I think it's like Webflow University. Um, I yeah, actually definitely. learned how to code using Dreamweaver. So I love Dreamweaver and I love <laughs> that they named that product Dreamweaver because it's such a good Ooh. name. Yes. Yeah, so, you're right. Um, yeah, well, you know, we're coming to the last couple minutes of our stream. So I do want to say thanks to Shirley for 
joining and thanks to everyone for stopping by. Um, I know that doodle therapy, our time has been shifting a little bit. You know, previously it was at two to two thirty on Mondays and Tuesdays, and we were really early for a day. And now we're back to Wednesdays and Thursdays at from three to four p.m. Pacific time, right after Kyle Webster's draw long stream. Um, so we'll be at this time um, for the next month. We're gonna have Bonnie Kate Wolf um, in two weeks, and then Nick Slater in two weeks after that. So um, yeah, definitely uh, feel free to join us if you uh, so wish. Um, yeah, and so I just want to say thanks to Shirley. Um, if you're interested in um, some of Shirley's work, you can check her out. And also she has a book coming out called Data Sketches, which is very exciting. Um, and uh, as well, for Alice me- did the cover for it? Yeah, and as for me, if you <laughs> want, if you have any questions, if you're watching the stream later and you, you know, had a question or comment, um, feel free to send me comments or questions. Um, I'm at by Alice Lee on Instagram, Twitter, Behance, etc., and I'm happy to um, share. Um, yes, Dream Team Dreamweaver for life. I, dude, I learned how to code <laughs> using Dreamweaver in the summer of 20, tw uh, 2009. So yeah, um, and yeah, Shirley, uh, do you have any you know final thoughts? Thanks for being, being on Ooh, as well. Yeah. Do you mind if I really quickly uh, kind of summarize what I've been doing? We have like 30 seconds. Ooh, okay, never mind. Hi, uh, <laughs> I'm uh, at all of the Twitters, the Instagrams, the YouTubes. I also stream on Twitch uh, at yeah. SXYWU. Um, and yeah, please check out uh, the book, uh, Data Sketches. If you're really interested in getting into data visualization and you want to see the behind the scenes process for like 24 data visualization projects. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and we all stay tuned for our stream in two weeks because um, me and Amy will be uh, launching a community discord and we'll have a doodle Ooh. therapy channel in that. So I know a couple of people have been asking me. So anyway, we're talking really fast now, but um, <laughs> I hope you all have a great day. Um, thanks for being awesome and curious. And I hope that, um, yeah, I hope that you have a great rest of the week. Bye. Bye.